Good evening and welcome to the 37th season of Quorum, your chance to hear what's going on in the legislature and your chance to make sure your voice is heard. Tonight we're joined by two lawmakers, Representative David Beria, a Democrat, and Senator David Blunt, also a Democrat. Representative Beria was in the Senate from 2008 to 2011 and is currently serving his first term in the House of Representatives. He represents District 122, which includes parts of Hancock County. Senator Blunt has been in the legislature since 2008. He represents District 29, which includes parts of Hines County. And we thank you gentlemen both for, uh, for joining us on this evening. Uh, with the weather such as it is, we appreciate you being here. MPB made repeated attempts, by the way, to have a Republican representation on tonight's panel, but no one we contacted was available to join us. Now don't forget, you can talk to the legislators, let them know your opinion or ask a question by calling this number. It's 1-877-405. 5247. You can also email us at quorum at mpvonline.org or if you use Twitter, just use the hashtag quorum, Q-U-O-R-U-M. Just over 24 hours ago, newly inaugurated Governor Phil Bryant laid out his vision of Mississippi's future in the governor's annual State of the State address. One item took up a sizable portion of the governor's speech, getting Mississippians back to work. In a short time since the inaugural, we have begun to implement a plan that I believe will help grow our economy in Mississippi and put more of our people to work. As I said in my inaugural address, my first job is to make sure every Mississippian has a job. To help accomplish this goal, I will ask the legislature for a package of measures that will be known as the Mississippi Works Agenda. The first part will include a dual enrollment process that will allow students on the verge of dropping out of school to enroll in a community college workforce training program. We will work, we will work to give these young adults a marketable skill to help them find jobs. I will ask the State Department of Education, the community colleges, and the Mississippi Department of Employment Security to come together to implement this program. We should set an, enroll, an enrollment goal and get to work so Mississippians can go to work. Uh, Senator Blunt, you've uh, got a history in uh, education. You, you're on the Education Committee. What, what do you think of a program like this or an initiative that would somehow, uh, in, in an effort to curb the dropout rate, or does that at the same time as trying to help folks who might drop out still, be, have to still find gainful employment? Can something like that work and how? I think it can, and one of the things that I, that I liked about the speech, and I think the governor's right on target, is the emphasis on community colleges. Mm -hmm. Our community colleges uh, do everything in Mississippi. They prepare people to go on to four-year universities and graduate school. They prepare people to go out there and earn a good living, to, earn a, to learn a profession, learn a skill, and go out there and make a good living. And they also have a role to play in dropout prevention. Uh, for people who, who may not see themselves going to a four-year institution, who may be considering dropping out of high school, uh, there's a role there for our community colleges to get people and say, look, you can, you can go to school, you can make a good living practicing um, a high-paying profession. Uh, so I think his emphasis on community colleges to do all those things is, is very solid. Uh, Representative Beria, what, what are your thoughts on a program like this, uh, the Mississippi Works Agenda, as he calls it? I agree completely with what Senator Blunt had to say about what the governor said and with what the governor said. Our community colleges do a magnificent job, really on very few resources in this state. And I'll just tell you one anecdote. We, we had a special session last year in which we passed some incentive bills for three different companies that were going to do business in Mississippi on a fairly large scale. And I asked one of the presidents, uh, of those entities, what is it that attracts you to Mississippi? And he said the number one thing is you have a quality, well-trained workforce, and, and that's done largely through our community college system. Because we have uh, had, we've got of course Nissan and, and now Toyota, and we've had other uh, big companies like that look at Mississippi, and that's always a key component. They're looking to locate in a place where you can provide them, the state can provide them with a uh, a certain level of skill or a certain uh, a workforce of a, of, a, of a certain caliber. Absolutely. They need people who are ready to go to work in their factories once they're built. And, 
and we uh, accomplish that goal through our community college system and workforce training programs that we already have in place. And so to enhance that, I think, is, is good for everybody in Mississippi. So, Senator Blunt, do you think we can uh, continue to turn out folks who are qualified to work and uh, work for businesses that might locate here? I think we can. I mean, we do have a successful workforce training program to teach people specific skills for specific jobs. And what I hear the governor saying, and I think he's right about this, is we can also use our community college system to address the dropout prevention. And because uh, we do have about a 40% dropout rate in this state. And I think it comes from a lot of people who, who don't see a path beyond high school. Mm. And so maybe this could offer some hope. I think that's right. And if people see a way to, to learn a profession, and, and we're looking at some innovative things to maybe do this before students are 18 years old and to keep people in, keep people learning when it may not be a traditional college tr track curriculum. So I think it's very exciting. Well, small businesses did not escape the eye of the new governor. He's asking the legislature to approve a new committee that will make sure that the Mississippi government itself is not hurting small businesses. Additionally, to aid expansion of our new existing businesses, I will ask for the introduction of the Mississippi Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Act which will authorize a small business regulatory review committee. Now their responsibility will be to review regulations in every state agency to determine first if it's a necessary function of government. And if so, is that regulation a hindrance to job creation? I believe we can modify many government rules to be more business friendly without destroying our planet or endangering lives. Last week, America saw the largest economic development project in America terminated by regulators and politicians in Washington. In Mississippi, I won't stand for job killing regulations. If we're hearing this right, it sounds like he's talking about a, a twofold uh, effort here to uh, to sort of uh, uh, prune government perhaps of, of, of uh, branches that don't need to be there and also to help boost small businesses. Uh, do you see merit in, in, in either one of those or both? I see merit in both of those. However, the approach I think is wrong hmm. because uh, while he wants to prune government, which everybody thinks is a pretty good idea, we're gonna create a new committee uh, more government, if you will, to do the pruning or to, to do the investigation and then perhaps the pruning. And I just don't think that's the right approach. Everyone agrees that there, there are probably, uh, there's probably waste in government. There are probably uh, bureaucracies that we don't need. And we should always be looking uh, to trim those bureaucracies and make it easier for our small businessmen and women to do business because, after all, they're the backbone of our economic system in Mississippi and this country. So I, I agree with the, with the sentiment. I don't agree with the approach. Are, are there uh, uh, committees or, or laws or regulations in government now that do have a negative impact on small businesses out well, there? Well, perhaps there are. I can't point to any in specific, but, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that there are businessmen and women out there who feel like they're overregulated. We hear it all the time. Um, and you know the, the system of taxation is, is strange and hard to understand for a lot of folks who can't afford to hire lawyers to, to exploit the system that we have. Uh, I, I would be willing to look at things like that, but I don't think we need a new bureaucracy uh, to go about searching through all of government to try to find red tape to cut because it's just more government, and, and I don't agree with that approach. Senator Blunt, is, is government too big, and is this the right approach to do something about that? Well, I think the question is, what is this committee that's being discussed? I mean, we have laws that are made by our elected officials. We're accountable to the public. We have to stand for election. Uh, we also have agencies that make rules and regulations, and I think that's what the governor is speaking about. Now, many of these agencies are directly report to the governor, and, and they're answerable to him. He's elected by the people to be the chief executive of the state, and, and it seems to me that if those agency heads work for him, that, that he can approach those agency heads and say, look, I have a problem. Uh, I, hear, I hear from people in the state they have a problem with the regulations of your agency. We have a process to go through that. I'm, I don't know where this committee is going to come from. I don't know if these folks are, who they're going to be accountable to. I assume they won't be elected. Uh, so we need to be careful when we need people. Ultimately, the laws and the rules and regulations need to be made by people who are directly accountable to the voters of Mississippi. And that means there are legislators who are elected or the governor and people who work for the governor because people people elect the governor to name these agency heads. He's responsible for those agency heads. He makes those appointments to those existing committees that are already out there. And he has he has the opportunity to lead the state uh, as he sees fit. But, I, you know, we need some more details on this and we don't need an unelected group of people 
essentially having veto power over every every aspect of state government. So now I don't know that, that, that that's what he's proposing, but we need some more details. We need to think about it clearly because what we want to do, as Representative Barry has said, is get rid of the rules and regulations that are hurting economic growth. But ultimately, of course, all of us in public life are accountable to the voters, and that's what we've got to have in this new in this new system, whatever it is. Well, still in the same line of thinking, the governor, governor said he also plans to keep attracting new businesses to the state, which would, of course, bring with them more jobs. In addition to our existing businesses, we must continue to incentivize new businesses to come to our state. Economic development is the sun in our universe, and everything else revolves around it. I will therefore, before this session is completed, ask for $31 million in bonds for economic development incentive packages. Now remember, that's less than half of what the legislature authorized last year. Now other special incentives may also be requested as the need arises. I will continue to aggressively pursue new industry at home and abroad, and when we are successful, I will ask for your help to bring them to Mississippi. All right, we want to turn our discussion to uh, one of our viewers now. Jarvis from Jackson is calling with a, with a comment, a question. Jarvis, go ahead. Um, I was listening to Governor Phil Bryant earlier today on the news, and I think he's going to be proposing or trying to put into place a act for people who receive public assistance to give back 20 hours a week into the community. Uh, what poses a big problem for a lot of people that are receiving assistance, a lot of people don't have transportation. So if he decides to pass this law, will he set up some type of transportation to get the individuals to and from uh, the volunteering? Um, um, I can't find the word, but wherever they're going to be volunteering, will he provide transportation to get them to and from? All right, uh, Jarvis, thank you for the question. And uh, Senator Bolan, I'll start with you. I think this actually came from not the governor, but from a couple of senators, if I'm not mistaken, who were, who were proposing a bill that would require some bit of community service for anyone on public assistance. Uh, uh, what do you think of the caller's question there, and do you, would you support a, a measure like that? I don't know the answer to the caller's question about transportation. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the bill. Uh, I, you know, I think that, that it's worthwhile to consider having everybody give back in some fashion. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily opposed to the concept, but I think there are valid uh, concerns as, as, you, as you think about putting something like that into practice. The caller's right. Some people don't have transportation. And I don't know if there's any, any provision in the bill uh, that would provide that or not. So I, I just don't know the answer to that. Representative Barry, your thoughts on a, on a requirement such as this? Well, this is the first I've heard of this, so uh, I guess I, I'm going to give you my knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. to it. And, and I think that um, the, the whole idea that um, the, the people who are receiving public assistance would need to perform 20 hours or more of community service presumes that the poor people who are receiving uh, public assistance are somehow lazy and they're not, they're not doing their part. And when I can tell you there are people in my district who work two jobs, single mothers who work two different jobs and they still receive public assistance because they can't make ends meet. Now you tell me how are they going to find time to do 20 hours of community service? You know, I, I just, I think this is a wrong-headed approach. It, it probably, uh, you know, panders to a certain group of people who like to hear this sort of thing, but I think this is a bad idea. Now, I do think we should means test people. I do think that people have to qualify before they should receive public benefits. And if they don't qualify, if they're trying to defraud the system, they should be not only, uh, they should not receive benefits, but they should be prosecuted if that's what they're doing. So I feel strongly about that, but, but I think this is a bad idea. All right, gentlemen, thank you both. Well, being less dependent on foreign energy sources is also on the new governor's agenda, which will hopefully in turn free up more tax dollars. Also, I am transmitting to the legislature the Energy Sustainability and Development Act of 2012. This will create incentives for manufacturing and industrial employers to make energy efficiency upgrades that will result in significant savings, allowing them to be more competitive, retain and hire more workers, and further invest in their operations. It will also create, this act will create the Biomass Center for Excellence, which will be a partnership of public, private, and education sectors to coordinate 
and promote biomass research, development, and manufacturing. In addition, performance incentives for public sectors will reduce the amount of tax dollars spent on energy by our government, freeing up money better spent on infrastructure, public safety, and education. All right, we seem to be hearing more about uh, being more um, about energy sustainability and using that as essentially an economic development tool. Is that, is, is that realistic? I think it is. We've already passed economic incentive packages in the last four years uh, to bring some of those industries to Mississippi. Uh, the thing that I think is, is a guaranteed winner for the state is to look at all the state agencies and the colleges and the universities that are out there and how how we can reduce our light bill, how we can improve our heating bill, how we can lower those costs that we know we've got to pay and, and as the governor said, put some of that money back into the, the needs that we have. We, we can do better in terms of managing uh, our buildings and our resources and, and these built-in costs that, we, that are necessary to running agencies and I think that's going to be good in the long term. So I, I, I'm interested in that part and that we have done things to bring new industry into the state. We need to, we need to take advantage of some of our research institutions to help with that. Uh, Representative Barrier, what do you think of the Energy Sustainability and Development Act of 2012, as the governor's well, calling it? I, I like the idea. This is something that's been a focus of mine ever since I was first elected to the legislature. In, in fact, the very first bill I passed as a senator was a bill that would require uh, our public buildings to become more energy efficient. And it started mm -hmm. with buildings that were very large, 20,000 square feet or more. And then it, each year, uh, it, over a four-year period, it, we got down to the smallest buildings that we own as a state, and, and they had to achieve a greater uh, level of energy efficiency. That's the simple sort of thing, turning off the lights, you know, more efficient light bulbs, more efficient heating and cooling systems. I, I'm in favor uh, of doing more of that, and I've also tried for four years to pass an incentive bill that would uh, reduce the upfront costs for solar, geothermal, uh, those sorts of um, sort of cutting edge, uh, well not so much anymore, but thought to be cutting edge uh, energy sources and you know and, uh, we were able to get it passed in the Senate and the House it failed one year. One year it couldn't pass in the Senate but the House passed a, a similar version. So I think this year with the governor getting behind something like this, mm -hmm. that bill has a good chance of success. And then finally the biofuels industry, you know we have a, we, we've, we're sort of well position to do that. We've got a lot of pine trees in Mississippi and, mm -hmm. and that's uh, one of the plants that we incentivized to come in, or one of the companies rather, that we incentivized to come into the state of Mississippi was going to build three or four plants using pine trees. Uh, that's great. It's going to provide jobs, it's going to improve our economy and we can be a leader in that field. But I do want to say this one cautionary thing, uh, one cautionary note if you will, is we have to be careful um, with, with the route we go because we know that corn subsidies uh, have and, and the use of corn in biofuels such as ethanol mm -hmm. have increased the price of feed which in, correspondingly increases the price of our food. Uh, so we, we have to be careful what we do with that and I'm sure that we will. We just need to move carefully going forward but it's a great idea and I applaud the governor for getting behind it. Well on that same line of thinking the governor went on to address another way uh, to play a way to save energy and save money at the same time. One way is by changing the state's fleet of automobiles from gasoline to natural gas. When it comes to energy innovation, my administration will lead by example. One aspect of this plan includes asking the Department of Finance and Administration to implement a pilot program for transitioning fleet automobiles to natural gas powered cars and trucks. Natural gas is clean. Hey, it is clean, more efficient, and more reliable, and will save taxpayers' dollars in government's day-to-day -day operations. We can and must save valuable tax dollars and achieve new energy innovations. Of the two uh, Representative Barry, I, I knew I've seen natural gas buses before on, on streets right. in, in other cities. I didn't know we could convert the whole fleet. Is that, is that a realistic proposition? Well, I'm no expert in, in what uh, types of engines can actually be converted, but my understanding is that almost any gasoline uh, engine can be converted to um, operate on natural gas or propane. Uh, we have 
uh, machinery that works in our plants right now that runs off of those types of fuels. And so, again, if it's a cost-saving measure and uh, we, you know, it, 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 and we don't have to drill as much oil and use as much oil and therefore be as dependent on foreign oil, then I think it's a good thing and we ought to look at it. I, I'm sure that someone has studied this before and can tell us uh, using a cost-benefit analysis whether this is something we ought to be engaged in. And I just heard today that uh, natural gas, prices for natural gas are at a 10-year low. Uh, and they expect them to stay low for a while. So maybe this will be a real cost-saving measure. Well, he said something as well about drilling for natural gas. He did. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. That's correct. And, and uh, I'm from the Gulf of Mexico, as you know, and from that area. And uh, we are interested in exploring, but we just, uh, we're still kind of smarting from the whole uh, BP right. uh, debacle down there. Now, it's a different, it's a different substance. Uh, I understand crude oil is not the same as natural gas, but we hear horror stories about fracking and the problems that causes. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, I want to move slowly. Uh, I, I do think that we should explore areas for natural gas outside of the islands. We don't want them up on our beaches uh, in Waveland or Bay St. Louis or Pascagoula. Uh, we need to be very careful and we, we need to make sure the proper regulations and safety mechanisms are in place so we don't have a problem. Well, uh, Senator Blunt, we've got a Republican governor talking uh, about two significant uh, items here about uh, that are essentially would make us more environmentally friendly. I, do you find that encouraging? I do. I mean, when we're talking about efficiency in government and industries where the state can really move forward, and I think energy is one of those industries, I think there's, there's bipartisan agreement on those things. I mean, all of us, all of us have supported these economic development projects that Governor Barber brought to the state. Uh, we're hopeful Governor Bryant will be able to bring the same projects to the state. You know, there's more, there's more bipartisan agreement at the Capitol than you, than you read about sometimes. So, and certainly efficiency in government and looking for ways to be innovative is something we're all behind. Well, the new governor continued his push for a medical corridor in Jackson and others elsewhere. It's not something new from Governor Bryant. He spoke about it on the campaign trail and also at his inaugural. But in his State of the State, we got a few more details on how he hopes to make that a reality. Of the two driving economic forces in our future, energy is one and of course health care is the other. As I've said many times before, we must expand our health care economy in Mississippi. To begin this process, I have proposed the creation of medical zones throughout Mississippi where a cluster of medical facilities and services exist. This will include, but will not be limited to, the medical corridor in Metro Jackson. Within these medical zones, we will encourage expansion by offering construction tax credits, job creation incentives where new high-tech careers begin. We must be mindful of the increasing demand for health care, realizing that collaboration of all health care providers is the only way to achieve success. We must heal together, research together, and find better ways to serve our citizens together. To achieve this goal, I have asked the Mississippi Economic Council to conduct a study to find how we can build greater economic development opportunities in health care. Now, this is not an academic study, but an action plan for the future of health care development all across our state. I have asked the nationally recognized researcher during the, doing the work for 10 recommendations to move our health care industry forward. This will be an effort unlike anything in the nation. A comprehensive action plan to provide health care as an industry of necessity. I look forward to sharing the progress of this with review with all of you before the end of this session. Senator Blunt, health care is a huge industry, not just here in Mississippi, but, but nationwide. Can we, uh, can we get more out of it here, economically speaking? Absolutely we can, and this is the thing that the governor said that I am most excited about. Really? As somebody who represents Metro Jackson, uh, part of Metro Jackson, I think this is, this is really exciting. Uh, you know, the University Medical Center is the second largest employer uh, in the state of Mississippi. In addition to that, it brings hundreds of millions of dollars into this state, either in, in terms of federal funding for basic health care, like Medicare and Medicaid, but also for research. And that's exciting for all sorts of possibilities. It's exciting for Jackson State University. It's exciting for Heinz Community College. Uh, I think he, this is the thing that I'm most excited about, and I think he's right on target. Uh, we need to do, and I know the governor has said this too, we need to expand our medical school. 
We need to have more doctors. That's going to improve not only the health care of our citizens, it's going to create jobs uh, all over this state. And so I, th I went today, just today, to Greater Jackson Chamber luncheon. We had the speaker who was the former economic director, economic development director from Mississippi, has worked in Georgia and also South Carolina. This was the number one issue that he proposed to, to the Greater Jackson Chamber. And uh, I think it's very exciting. And uh, I'm, I'm, I just think it's going to can really do great things for not only for central Mississippi, but also we have medical centers in Tupelo and on the Gulf Coast and in Hattiesburg. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. Well, uh, Representative Barry, he, he represents the Jackson area specifically. You're on the coast. Do you see this as, uh, could we have more pockets of, of, of larger medical communities outside of Jackson, the coast and elsewhere? Uh, absolutely. Uh, while Senator Blunt didn't mention it, Hattiesburg has a very mm -hmm. large uh, medical center, if you will. And, and I'm sure there, there are other places across the state. I just happen to be familiar with that one. And, and yes, we can and should expand those areas. Th this <coughs> particular part of the governor's speech, I, I was particularly enamored with because this is a big, bold sort of initiative. I think he's going in the right direction with this. This is something that we can take advantage of in Mississippi. Our health care providers already do a very, very good job. Our hospitals are expanding and doing well. Um, and, and having said all of that, I hope we're very careful not to impose any new taxes mm -hmm. on the hospital. I was opposed to that three years ago uh, when Governor Barber wanted to do that, and I'm, a, I'm still opposed to it. We should not do that. Taxes on the hospitals themselves. Well, we call it a hospital bed tax. Mm -hmm. We, we right. force them essentially to pay $90 million uh, in taxes to make up the difference in our, our Medicaid payment. And uh, that, that particular bill that was passed that year is up for renewal. Uh, now, I don't know what's going to happen to it. I don't think the governor has stated his position on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Senator Blunt's position is on it. I'm telling you what my position is. I'm opposed to it. Gotcha. All right, we're going to get to another uh, viewer question now. Remember, you can email us at quorum at mpbonline.org. You, know, you can also give us a call, 1-877-405-5247. And we have a caller on the line right now. This is Bozzi, Bobby excuse me, from uh, Yazoo County. Bobby, go ahead with your question, please, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I'd like to know, I have two questions briefly. Which political party is behind the uh, eliminate the 13th check for the state employees retirement fund? And my other question is, which political party is behind the fishing rod and hunting rifle tax? And if they could briefly explain it, I'd appreciate it. Who wants to take that one? I'll be glad to start. I, I don't know <clears throat> that, that any political party has as its platform either one of those issues. Uh, I will say this, there have been uh, attempts to take the 13th check, so to speak, to use his language, and uh, those bills were filed by Republicans. And, and I know, uh, for instance, Congressman Palazzo filed one of those when he was a member of the Mississippi House of Representatives. But we have heard uh, this past summer, I think a lot of members, uh, Republican members of the legislature, signed a pledge and said, we're not going to do that. The governor, I think, has stated his position on that, and he said, we're not going to do anything with the 13th check. I take those men and women at their word, and I think that, uh, that they're, they're telling the truth. They don't want to do anything with the 13th check. If, if that's what they say, then I believe them. Now, with respect to the, the other issue, I think what he's referring to is Governor Barber's proposal to cut 24, 25 percent out of the budget of wildlife, fisheries, and parks. And there, there's just no way for that department, that agency, to make that up other than passing it along to users, which means that your, your hunting licenses and your, your fishing licenses and, and those sort of fees that users pay will have to go up if we were to pass the governor's, Governor Barber's recommendation. I don't know what uh, Governor Bryant's recommendation is, but I can tell you this, um, I, I'm, I'm a floor leader for the Democrats in the House, and we will not support taking 24 percent out of the budget of wildlife, fisheries, and parks. A lot of uh, a lot of hunters, fishermen uh, in this state. It's of course a huge uh, a huge hobby and an industry uh, well, and it's in just, itself. It's, you're right. It's an industry that provides dollars to our economy. It's part of our tourism industry, and we should be promoting it and incentivizing it, and not making it harder to hunt and fish. You do have a lot of people who come from out of state to yes, hunt sir. and fish in, in Mississippi. Uh, what about this issue of the the 13th check, Senator Blunt? It's a it seems to be a a hot button issue every time it comes up. Then you get into the slurp fund. There's so many issues. We could spend a whole program, I think, on this uh, alone. What's your position on the 13th check? Well, of course, it, it was a hot issue in the campaign, what to do about the public employee's retirement system. Mm -hmm. And the 13th check, for your viewers who may not know, is an annual cost of living increase. It's 3%, which is the average uh, rate of inflation over the last 80 years. And it, it is added to uh, the check 
it, they, it comes in one check instead of one twelfth at each check that a retiree receives. Instead of get a, a three percent raise, you get a three percent check essentially at the end of the year. That's is that correct. That's correct. And you know, it was it was said uh, by uh, some folks, primarily again Republicans, that this issue in the campaign was just a scare tactic. That nobody wanted to do anything with it. Uh, you now, Governor Barber established a commission. Governor Barber's commission, which issued a report after the election, called for freezing the 13th check for three years. That's what it said. Uh, I'm opposed to that. The cost of living increase, again, is 3%. It is the average rate of inflation over the past 80 years, and it's what ki gives people the purchasing power uh, to survive and to keep the economy moving. So, uh, now, I haven't seen any legislation dealing with the 13th check uh, introduced so far, but, but it is a legitimate issue. It was not a scare tactic in the campaign. It was recommended uh, by Governor Barber's commission to freeze the 13th check for three years, and I don't think that's what we need to do. And if anybody's proposing it, I think we need to defeat it. Do you expect someone to bring this up at some point during the legislative session? Well, I mean, there are all kinds of crazy bills filed, and I can't predict what anybody might do. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not going to. As I said, support anything that would change the cost of living increase. And, and again, that's what it is. People hear 13th check and they think it's some kind of bonus. It's not. It is a cost of living increase and it needs to be protected. Wilson, could I make one more comment Certainly. on that? The, the Democrats in the legislature are solidly in favor of exactly what Senator Blunt, uh, Blunt just uh, enunciated. That, that position is that we're not going to do anything with the 13th check. Um, and, and the primary reason is because we made a promise to these folks who are in our retirement system and the promise was that this is what you're going to get when you retire. It would be wrong, it would be morally wrong in my opinion to go back and change the promises and break the promises that we made to those folks. So, so we're solidly in support of keeping that part of PERS just the way it is. All right, we'll, we'll move, we will move on now and talk more about the State of the State Address. Uh, Governor Bryant addressed taking care of our own health to help save the state money by bringing down health care costs. And he announced a way he hopes will start getting people focused on their health. As citizens, we must do a better job with our individual health care. Every Mississippian should realize that a sound diet and exercise program will save lives and reduce health care costs. We should not be the most obese state in the nation leading the worst statistics of heart attacks and strokes. Mississippians walk, run, go to the gym, plant a garden or ride a bike. Getting active is the key to your own health care. And I, again, intend to lead by example. Each year, I hope you will join me on a 5K run starting at the governor's mansion. I look forward to seeing you this summer for our first 5K Governor's Run for Health. Echoes of let's go walking, but let's go running in this case. It's, uh, is there a way you could legislate this kind of thing, or is this, do you think, just a, 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 a call to action, quite literally? I think that's what it is, and it's a, it's a good initiative, and our, our leader should be leading by example. I appreciate uh, the fact that he's, he's taking that mantle. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious as to whether he realizes that a 5K run is actually 3.1 miles that he has to run. <laughs> uh, but I hope to join the governor in, in running uh, his first 5K. Uh, Senator Blunt, you, 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 both of you gentlemen look to be in, in pretty good shape, so you probably are, are taking that advice already to heart. Well, I'll be happy to. Uh, I think it's a good idea to have a 5K run, and I'll be sitting on the sidewalk chair for him. So, uh, I think it's a good idea. Very good. All right. Well, we have a question through Twitter now. Again, if you'd like to pose a question to us through Twitter, you can use the hashtag quorum. And we have a question that, uh, that we've gotten on Twitter just now. Here it is. Can you explain a little more about what a medical zone is? Uh, this is from Nina on Twitter. Uh, I don't know how much you gentlemen know about that because this came out of the governor's state of the state address, but he talked about those medical zones that he wants to create in places all across the state. And I guess, what, in your view, what would a, med what would a perfect medical zone be? What would you like to see Outside of Jackson, you talked. We know there's a good medical zone here. There's there's a strong medical presence. What do you think could um, exemplify a, a, a good medical zone somewhere else in the state? Well, and there are areas across the state. Obviously, our only university research center and medical school is in Jackson. But as Representative Barry says, there's a there's a large healthcare community in Hattiesburg and in Tupelo and in other parts of the state. Uh, what I think he's talking about, and I th and I think it's a good idea, are tax incentives uh, to build uh, to to issue. Uh, 
infrastructure, in the way we would for, for any uh, economic development project, to ha have state provide help with infrastructure, to have state provide help with tax incentives, to do things to, to, to incentivize private economic development, not only at the hospital, but all the professionals uh, that work around that hospital to provide health care. And uh, Representative Barry, I guess that's, that's essentially what he's saying. We have these clusters of, of health care uh, facilities that, uh, we, that are all there because of some sort of incentives. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, I think Senator Blunt is probably correct. We don't have any details on this at this point, but that's what I envision uh, that he's describing. And, and, you know, heretofore, these areas have sort of uh, grown organically. A hospital gets built, and then there are all these providers that grow up around them. Uh, and, and I think what we're trying to do is trying to spur additional growth and, and take advantage of that market. And, and I think Senator Blood described it uh, appropriately. We'll just have to wait and see the details. All right, for this uh, next clip, he talked a little bit about uh, the Mississippi Adequate Education Program, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more on that just now. Increasing the educational achievements of Mississippi is critical to developing our future workforce. To help in this effort, I will offer an executive budget recommendation that will level fund MAEP and will also seek to replace funding for high growth areas and fully fund the National Board Certified Teacher Program. We must do all we can, even during these challenging times, to keep our best teachers in the classroom. Additionally, we must make sure our teachers graduate from college prepared to teach. Just now, Dr. Hank Bounds and Dr. Tom Burnham are working to increase minimum entrance standards for teacher training programs at our universities. We must have the best and brightest students in our university classrooms to become the best teachers in our schools. What do you make of, uh, what does it mean to, to have level funding of the Mississippi Adequate Edu Education Program, MAAP? You're our education guy, what do you make of that? Well, Representative Barry and I have both worked on these issues since we've been in the legislature. Level funding means you're going to get what you got last year. Now, what you got last year is a little more than between 200 and 250 million, I believe, less than what the formula calls for. Because it's 38 million below the formula. So, so it's not the same thing as, as fully funding. Level, funding is, level funding is getting what you got last year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, full funding is, again, there is a formula. It's in the statute. You plug in the variables. So obviously, the biggest variable is the local tax rate and how many students you have. And that produces a number that fairly distributes uh, funding, state funding, to every school district in the, in the state. Uh, we should full fund it every year. We all know that. Uh, given the economic realities, I don't think that, that you're going to see a budget proposal from either party that will fully fund MAEP in this budget year. Mm -hmm. uh, but level funding would not take us backwards. Uh, Were uh, you surprised that he proposed level funding, or is it about what you expected? Well, I'm interested to see, uh, you know, he, Governor Bryan has not released his budget yet. Right. Uh, Governor Barber did one before he left office, and we're going to have to see where the money comes from. Uh, the, uh, I think it's encouraging. Uh, the, obviously, the National Board Certified Teachers is very important for your viewers who don't know. That is an extra test. Uh, it is given on a national level. These are the best teachers uh, in the state and who go back to school and get an additional degree, and they get a salary supplement on top of what they would get paid ordinarily. And we need to do that. Uh, we need to make that, we need to follow through on that commitment when we say to people, if you go through this process and earn this, this level of, uh, of education, then we're going to pay you uh, what we said. I think that's positive. Uh, you know, I, I, but again, it's, it's, it's what we did last year, and that's okay, but we really need to aim higher than that and do better than that, I think. Do you envision a day when, when we might fully fund MAEP? Well, I, I envision a day when we will have the money to fully fund MAEP, mm -hmm. and it will be a test of political courage, I guess, whether we actually fully fund MAEP, because my understanding, and I, and I could be corrected here, but my understanding is we've only fully funded MAEP one time. And we, while we funded it, we left the legislative session, came back later, and took money away from it. So we've never really completely fully funded MAEP. And, and understand, it, it, is, it was designed to be a floor, not a ceiling. It was adequate, not excellent. Mm. So we, we've never gotten to adequate. And just over the past several years, we have underfunded MAEP, the floor, uh, by over $500 million. That's hard to make up. 
Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do about it, but it remains a priority for me and members of my party to, full it to, the fu uh, to, uh, to fund it to the fullest extent possible. And maybe the best we can do this year is level funding uh, from last year. But at some point, we have to decide whether this formula needs to be scrapped because we can't ever fully fund it or we're not going to, uh, or we need to step up when, when revenues return and really do what we said we're going to do and fully fund MAEP. Going to turn to the phone lines now. We have a couple of viewers on the line with, waiting with questions uh, for you, gentlemen. The first uh, is Richard from Clarksdale. Uh, Richard, go ahead with your question, please. Very short question. Your conversation about the PERS uh, changes or possible changes or proposed changes. Uh, isn't there a legislative deadline for filing any legislation dealing with PERS or the funding thereof or changes thereof? Senator Blunt? There is. Uh, one of the things that the Mississippi Legislature does well is we do work on a deadline system and those deadlines <coughs> work. Uh, the deadline for, I believe, drafting and filing bills is in mid-February uh, and all of this is available on the Mississippi Legislative website. Uh, there is a deadline and I, we, will, we may see those filed and uh, we all need to watch that closely because, it, and I should emphasize, PERS, the Public Employees Retirement System, and the public employees retirement system is only 20% state employees. The vast majority are folks who work for school district. They're teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have <laughs> city employees and county employees, all of us in one system. And that system has a board of independent people who are elected by the members who come to the legislature every year with recommendations on how to keep the system strong. And uh, the the PERS board will probably come to us with a recommendation. Now whether a member of the legislature will introduce a bill that, that, that goes along with some of the recommendations of Governor Barber's study committee, I don't know. But we should know that by this deadline in February. February That's 20th, right. 20th? I think it's right. February 20th yeah. is, our, is our deadline for filing new, leg new bills. So and between now and then we'll learn if there are going to be any att uh, ch attempts to change anything. Well, uh, it is a, you know, there's, it's a complicated process. That's the deadline for introducing bills, but you know, the deadline for introducing amendments to bills is as long as we're in town. Mm -hmm. So you need to be mm -hmm. vigilant. So, uh, and we in the press will work on that as well. We have another caller, uh, Preston, calling from Jackson. Preston, go ahead with your uh, question, please. Well, gentlemen, I happen to be a Republican, but I think both of y'all are doing an outstanding job. Okay, uh, my thank question, you. I have uh, two questions. Uh, number one is, I, I, I do realize there's a lot of state employees that, uh, that uh, are retiring. And uh, it seems like that quite a few of them, after taking full retirement, uh, are hired back as consultants, and I, 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 uh, I, I really see a, a, a big problem with that. Uh, I consider it almost like double dipping, and uh, it's not right, and I would appreciate it if you all would do something about it. Uh, second thing is, uh, I don't know whether anybody's called uh, to the legislators' attention that the proposed building that the state tax commission is going in in downtown Jackson, uh, you know, there, there's quite a quite a large uh, uh, sum of money that's going to be paid on lease payments on that building by the state. Those payments are not only going outside of the state; they're going outside of the United States because that building is owned by a Canadian company. And I, I really think that uh, that needs to be looked in very closely because. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the money shouldn't even go out of the state, much less out of the United States. All right, Preston, thank you Appreciate for the question. Appreciate comment. Thank sure. You. Uh, Senator Blunt, you, you, you live in the Jackson area. What, can, what do you know about this, uh, this arrangement he's talking about? Well, uh, I want to talk to the issue of where the state tax commission should be located. I quickly want to say I think the caller's right as it relates to consultants. Uh, that's something that we need to watch carefully because when people are hired back as consultants, they're no longer contributing into the PER system, and I think the caller's on target with that. As it relates to the Department of Revenue, used to be called State Tax mm -hmm. Commission, uh, what we need is a state policy about whether we're going to build new buildings all over the state and spread out all over the metro area, or whether it is a more efficient use and a more physically responsible use of the taxpayers' money to pay rent and encourage private competition from people who own buildings. And, and ask yourself the question, who can build and maintain a building better and more efficiently? Can the private sector do it or can government do it? And in my opinion, the private sector can do it better. And in addition to that, when we have properties that are leased, 
that the private owner takes the depreciation and those funds stay on the tax rolls. We don't, and, and that's what we ought to be doing. Those buildings are privately owned and they're privately maintained. That's the fiscally responsible thing to do. And uh, I, I didn't know about this Canadian company, but the what the state doesn't need to be doing is borrowing money, building buildings. We're going to pay more than we should because we can't build it as efficiently and as well as the private sector. And what we ought to be doing is leasing buildings and, and keeping them on the tax rolls. Representative Barry, uh, back to the uh, uh, back to this idea of, of retirees, folks who retire from uh, from a government job, being hired as consultants. Is that a problem? I think it is. I think it's a it's a, an enormous drain on our system, our PERS system, and something needs to be done about it. And I, and I would point out that uh, the Republican Party is now in charge of basically all of the levers of government in this state. So uh, if, if that's something that they want to do something about, they have the machinery of government and they can take action, and they should. Because it, it, you know, it, there's. If I was retiring at this point with a with a nice retirement from the PERS system and could be rehired immediately and make half that salary or more, uh, why wouldn't I take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. So we we need to uh, set up a system where we don't allow this to happen. Now there are the, the argument goes that well these folks have more expertise than others, and, and that's true. But um, it, we have to put some uh, put something in place, some procedures in place, so that they don't simply um, it's, it doesn't become as rampant as it is now or get worse because it is a terrible drain on our system. Well, we hear about that every now and then uh, in the press as well, that they're, they're, folks know somebody who worked for years and now is, is going back and making that much money sometimes or more, and uh, it does frustrate some people. I can understand. Uh, as it should, yeah. Education, which takes up a majority of the state's <clears throat> budget, is certainly on the governor's agenda. During his State of the State address, Governor Bryant asked for education administration consolidation. I will also ask the legislature to pass the Education Administration Consolidation Bill. That will mandate that nine educational duties of school districts be consolidated to one central county office by 2014. That means centralized human resources directors, centralized purchasing, centralized transportation, and other duties that can be consolidated without disturbing one single student or teacher. In the 1980s, Mississippi passed the unit system law for county administrative duties. It took the old county beat system and consolidated them into one central unit. Elected officials retained their duties while county governments became more efficient. Let us take that model to our school districts. I want education dollars spent in the classroom and not just offices. Senator Blunt, this is an issue that comes up every now and then as well about consolidation and the uh, Mississippi's many school districts. And uh, is there waste, is there uh, inefficiency in these, school, these, these many school districts and their uh, administrative offices? Well, a couple of things. Obviously, do we need six school districts in one relatively small county? No, we don't. Uh, we don't need to have that many school districts in one county. Uh, now, the savings to the state, I would emphasize, though, are minimal because, again, the state funding formula for education is driven by the number of students. You've got the same number of students in that county. Uh, if there's waste and inefficiency, it's happening at the local level. But, he, but you have a superintendent for each one of those little districts, do you not, that, who, who could be paid a, that's a right, large That's right, that's right. But the, the impact on the state, but I think the savings should be occurred at the local level with ta property taxes that are paid at the county level. Now, the, the reason we ought to look at consolidation is because if you have six school districts in one county, are you going to have six physics teachers? Are you going to have six calculus teachers living in that county? No, you're not. The reason to do it is not it might save the state a little bit of money. Uh, it will save the state a little bit of money. The reason to do it is so you can provide a better education to the children who live in that county. So you're talking about educational efficiency more than, I guess, business efficiency, economic efficiency. I mean, what we need to be about is raising the educational achievement of the students. I mean, if it costs more money to do that, we ought to be willing to spend more money. If we're wasting money and we're not getting that achievement, then we need we need to redirect that. Uh, but it's, consolidation is a tricky issue, and we, uh, one of the, it sounds like what the governor's talking about is consolidating at the county level. Now, in some counties, that may work. Uh, in my county, for example, Hines County, you have Jackson, which is the second largest district in the state, and two 
relatively large districts in Clinton and Hines County. Do you need to consolidate those three districts? I don't think you do because you've got two districts that are already very large and then the second largest district in the state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need some details. We need to eliminate administrative waste where we see it. There are places where consolidation needs to occur, but we don't need to come out and say, well, we're just gonna have one school district uh, in every county because it may not work for Madison, it may not work for Lauderdale, it may not work for Harrison. Uh, you know, we need to look at it more carefully. And he stopped short of saying, the governor did, of, of actually uh, consolidating districts, but Representative Barry, do you think that there's a need to consolidate some of these rural school districts in particular? Well, I would echo what Senator Blunt said. And in, in some cases, in some counties, yes. In other counties, no. And, and he, he makes a very good point about the school districts in Hines County. Uh, I have two very good school districts in my county right now. And, and when I had a Senate district, I had uh, Pastor Christian in my district as well, which is one of the best in the state. I don't think it would have served any of the three to consolidate all three of them. But where we can achieve efficiencies, we absolutely need to be doing that. And, um, and I agree with what the governor said that money needs to be primarily spent in the classroom. And that the reason why he says that and the reason why I agree is because it has to be about uh, better education for our children and improving uh, the education that they're receiving in our classrooms. And we all agree with that. But how we get there, there's a little bit of dis disagreement here and there. All right, we want to get to some more of your questions now. Remember, you can email us at quorum at mpbonline.org. You can call 1-877-405-5247, or you can tweet us using the hashtag quorum. And we have a Twitter question now. Uh, Jeremy asks, what can be done to help parents pay for private or Christian schools? Uh, Senator Blunt, I'll let you take that. Is that something that uh, the state needs to get involved with at all? I don't think so. Uh, as we've talked about tonight, we have severe uh, budget crises. We have to meet our obligation to fund the public schools of this state. Ninety percent of the children in Mississippi go to public schools. I respect the decision that any parent wants to make to send uh, his or her child to the place they want that child to go. And that's their right, and, and I support any parent's right to do that. But the state of Mississippi should not spend taxpayer money uh, to support the private school system. We have to support the public school system, and that's what we're about. And uh, because, again, that's where 90% of our children go to school, and we've got to make sure that they get the best possible education. So uh, if, if the caller uh, wants to make that decision for his child, then I respect that. But, you know, it's a private school, and it needs to be paid for with private money. Representative Barry? I could not have said it any better than Senator Blunt and well, did, and I'm not going to add anything to that. I agree with him wholeheartedly. We'll leave it there then. Uh, now to something uh, that is not connected to the state of the state, but uh, something Governor Bryant was faced with on his first day in office, and y'all are both well aware of this, uh, and many of you as well. In the final hours of Governor Haley Barber's term, he granted some 200 pardons, an act that has angered some across the state and indeed across the country. Uh, on this past Monday, Hines County Circuit Judge Tommy Green agreed to postpone a ruling on whether some of Governor's, Governor Barber's pardons were invalid. And now the next hearing is scheduled for February 1st. So we'll find out what happens next in this chapter. Uh, Representative Barry, you had already uh, proposed some legislation, what, a couple of years ago That's right. that uh, addresses this issue that would, that would allow for some, uh, I guess oversight's not the wrong word, but some involvement of other people uh, in this process, right? Absolutely, uh, and I think it was 2008, uh, Michael David Graham, who stalked and brutally murdered his ex-wife at a stoplight in Pascagoula, Mississippi, with a shotgun, uh, had his sentence commuted by Governor Barber. And it was, it was shocking, and it angered a lot of folks in that community. I happened to grow up in Jackson County, and I, had, uh, I knew of that family. Uh, so I began to work on uh, some sort of mechanism so at least family members, and uh, law enforcement personnel who arrested and prosecuted that individual, uh, district attorneys who uh, prosecuted and put that person in jail could be notified and their feelings could at least be heard and considered by the governor prior to the governor exercising his constitutional prerogative to pardon that person. I, I didn't want to do away with the right to pardon, but I thought those were reasonable safeguards to put in place. So I tried 2009, 2010, and 2011 and was unsuccessful each of those years. Well, um, nobody had thought much about it until this came up, and now the whole country, uh, at least for a little while, was, t was talking about it. So are you going to uh, try to get this done again? Yes, I, I am, and I've already uh, filed that very same bill uh, that I just described, and I filed another bill which would prevent 
uh, those convicted of murder from serving as trustees at the governor's mm -hmm. mansion, which apparently has become a path to a pardon. Uh, and I, I applaud um, Governor Bryant, who has removed murderers as from the trustee status that they enjoyed mm -hmm. at the governor's mansion. But I, I don't want to see us go overboard because I'm an attorney. I practiced law for 22 years. I believe in second chances too, but I would limit that to drug crimes and nonviolent offenses mm -hmm. and, and you know those those sorts of the persons uh, who were convicted of those crimes. They should still be allowed to serve as trustees as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the pardon uh, should be exercised on those kind of convicts and not on brutal murderers. Senator Blunt, do you think that uh, this whole issue would be in court as it is now if the Attorney General were not a Democrat? No, I don't. I don't. I, I, I respect Jim Hood and uh, I'm not an attorney, but I think he's been an outstanding Attorney General. Uh, you know, I think everybody in Mississippi was very surprised by the pardon issue. There is a role for pardons, uh, but you know, Representative Barry and other Democrats in the legislature have been working on this issue uh, for years, trying to get something done, uh, and we were unsuccessful. I think there's now going to be a bipartisan interest in this subject. Uh, again, there's a there's a role for the pardon, but to do some of the things that Representative Barry is talking about, to involve the victims, and to simply comply with the state constitution which specifically has a notice requirement to make sure if you're going to issue pardons, you ought to at least comply with what the Constitution says. Uh, that's what we ought to do. We'll see what happens because that story is not over yet. That's right. The final chapter has not been written. Representative David Beria, Senator David Blunt, the two Davids with us this evening. We thank you for joining thank us. You, Wilson. That thank is you. all the time we have tonight. We hope you will join us next Wednesday at 7 across the state right here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting as the 37th season of Quorum continues. I'm Wilson Stribling. Good night.